Hi kittens. I'd like to talk a little bit about being a witch from my own personal perspective, which is going to be a bit weird and new because I must admit I've only just recently re-owned the word witch, but I've been owning it on and off for many, many years since childhood. I've always been fascinated by witches and felt a massive resonance with witches and with witchcraft. Ever since I was a small child I've loved witches in books and films. I always used to pretend to be a witch. If there was ever any playing to be done in childhood I was a witch. <laughs> I was always walking around dressed up as a witch, doing spells on people. Uh, I loved certain witches, like I loved the witch from The Wizard of Oz, the Wicked Witch of the West and um, Glinda, the good witch to a lesser extent. I loved the white witch from Narnia. Um, I just thought she was great. I used to dress up as her. I had a crown that was really similar to the one that she wore in the BBC TV series, which will be very little known, but which was absolutely amazing at the time when I was a kid. Anything with a witch in it, I loved. Um, but I was more inclined towards bad witches. Uh, in films and I think that's because they had dark hair and pale skin like me and also because they were quite flamboyantly dressed. I remember this one film that I had of um, Snow White which was kind of like it had Diana Rigg in it as the evil stepmother with the magic mirror and she was just awesome because she was so flamboyantly dressed and she had all these different cool hair combs and cloaks and stuff and I loved that because I just I knew from day one that I was like really sartorial and was really interested in clothing and stuff and um, I still blog about clothes now and um, just love getting dressed so I think that that was part of it as well but I also think that even as a child I recognised that the black magic and the dark energy and you know the bad things that witches could do were probably really just a grotesque caricature of something real which was a woman that kind of knows all of nature and is involved and in touch with the whole of the spectrum of nature and what it can do and what it is. So I think that I even at that young age I didn't see Obviously I knew within the context of the movie or within the context of the book that these witches were bad but I, I saw it as something deeper than that as well. I, I think even at that young age I understood that black and white magic was actually just the stuff of fiction and that deeper down the heart of the witch is much more complex than that and that a witch kind of strives for any and all kind of knowledge and is just as attracted to the brutal as they are to the beautiful. So I think that's another reason why bad witches were so cool but also they were just so cool. I mean... When I was a kid, um, I used to buy those Halloween witchy fingers and put them on all the time and walk around the house with them, like casting spells on objects and the cat and things like that. Um, I used to talk to myself in a mirror. I used to have this, we had this heater at home, like this really 80s heater that had two kind of like um, mirrored bits on the sides. And my mum said that when I was a kid, I used to talk into that mirror all the time, like a witch, like gesticulating wildly and saying, I've locked the princess in the tower and only a spell can break the spell or something <laughs> so even at that young age I I just loved pontificating about all things witchy and magical and then kind of my involvement with nature as I got a little bit older as well like 12 13 kind of age my mum actually told me that I was a pagan or she kind of just dropped it into a conversation she said Kellyanne is so pagan and I think that was where the knowledge of the word pagan actually came into existence for me so that's quite interesting as well and my mum is really like spiritually outward and very interested in certain different traditions. So I think I've spoken about that in a former video as well. And as I grew older, even older still, she would take us to folk festivals, like four day folk festivals, where there would be a lot, a lot of yoga going on, tarot cards being read, hippies with dreadlocks, setting up wigwams, traveling families, believing all kinds of different things. So I was very exposed to this other world. So I quickly became aware that witches were not just the stuff of fiction. And I really believe that I knew for a very long time that I was a witch because I just felt such a resonance and I felt so at one with the whole idea of everything that a witch is. And another thing I'll just say when I, that I did when I was a kid, aside from dressing up as the White Witch from Narnia, I also used to dress up as the Wicked Witch of the West and I had... Um, a, uh, you know, like in the film, The Wizard of Oz, she has that hourglass and it's full of green glittery sand. My dad had one of them made for me. He was a master carpenter and he had one of those made for me. He built the body um, and had the hourglass thing put in with the green sand in it. And I also had a mortar and pestle because she uses one of them in the film. 
So they got me one of them as well from like a home base store or something. So yeah, I love the props and I love just the whole idea of manifesting energy to do your will kind of thing. So I think, yeah, it's something that came really organically and naturally to me. And then as I got older, I think that it, I think that the reason that somebody would reject the term witch when they're so evidently organically a witch is because they lose the magic in their actual lives and they they lose like the belief in themselves and they stop they stop recognizing and identifying with their own core being and they stop recognizing how beautiful everything is and how much they are a part of it and that is part of what happened to me you know i had quite a difficult adolescence and i had a difficult early part of my 20s to an extent as well I had to deal with a lot of stuff, um, a lot of emotional issues, a lot of mental health issues. I, I didn't have a lot of respect for myself at times. I abandoned myself and I felt very apart from everything else. And I don't think that you can be a decent practicing witch and have pride in that word if that's how you are, if you've completely lost connection with your core being. Joseph Campbell said something really interesting once about the difference between the psychotic and the mystic, about how the psychotic will drown in the waters that the mystic gracefully swims in because the mystic has the mental equipment to deal with what they're seeing and feeling. Um, and I think that's very true. Like I, I do have um, a history with certain very complex mental health issues, which I don't actually want to go into that much on the channel, but I do feel like that saying about the difference between the psychotic and the mystic rang true for me when I first read it and still rings true now. I think that it takes that knowledge and that mental preparation to swim in those waters instead of drowning in them. So I guess that's something I wanted to say as well. And thinking about what magic actually means to me now, to be honest with you, ritual is much more of my practice than magic ever will be. Ritual is so important for me. I really believe it's the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious. I believe it's the bridge between realms. I believe that it helps us to give importance to the burden of our consciousness. And it is a very real burden at times. It's a difficult thing to be self-aware and sentient and to have these deeper understandings that make life so complex and tangled. And I feel like ritual just gives us the chance to celebrate consciousness as a gift instead of thinking upon it as a burden and I also think that it helps us to inject magic into our lives in a very real way and it helps us to appreciate what's going on and to be a part of it in a conscious way um, often Jungian psychoanalysts will say that the last part of getting rid of something negative from your life or the last part of the bad thing before you manifest and transform into the good thing is a ritual you know a ritual must be done to let go to say goodbye to release and there are many modern kinds of therapy that tap into this idea as well that a ritual will allow you to let go and release so that you can open up and embrace and I think that's true too so ritual is much more a part of my practice than magic but what I wanted to say about magic is that there are supposed to be three magical models um spirit, energy and psycho psychological. Spiritual magic, the spiritual model is the idea that there are these spirit guides and um, you know like fairies, gods that each have their own specific personality that are real, that exist on another realm, that communicate with us and such. So it's very much about embracing those things outside of scientific understanding or thinking of mythology, mythological systems as being um, absolutely as real as you and me are but kind of existing on another plane. And then you've got energy, the energetic model, which kind of accepts that there are subtle energies everywhere that can be manipulated and harnessed and tapped into in order to make something happen. Or this idea that crystal healers have, that crystals are kind of a lot like uh, microchips in computers, you know, they can be used just the same way. Uh, and this taps into quantum physics theories and stuff. And then the psychological model, which is kind of like the difference between thinking of tarot as a way to commune with the divine and get messages from the divine and thinking of tarot as a way to transform yourself personally and a way to explore yourself personally. The psychological model will be more about how magic changes you than it than about how it changes anything else or about the idea that really magic is all in the mind but not in terms of it being imagined, just in terms of the fact that your mind is the only tool that's actually doing anything. It's not actually about deity and about your connection with any kind of divinity, it's about kind of the psychological divinity within, the divinity of consciousness which makes things manifest. And I think that I kind of fall between those three models like essentially I would say that I follow the psychological model, but I do use belief as a tool in a lot of ways. In my in my chaos and customization video, I talked about hard polytheism and how I actually behave a lot like a hard polytheist in many ways, particularly when it comes to my connection with Hell, who's my patron goddess. 
I think that belief as a tool is important because belief as an absolute won't always serve you. Sometimes you need to have a look at what the different circumstances are and how you can best use belief to forge forward. And I think I do do that. So I think in a way I do follow all three models. Of course, I follow the energetic model as well. I do believe in the subtle energies and the vibrational frequencies. And I believe there's things that we can do to control or change them or harness them or even just understand them to a greater extent. So yeah, I think all three models work for me. I think if I had to pin myself to one, it would be the psychological model, but I think that all three are really important. And I also think that high and low magic, which is something that I've considered on and off because I do consider any magic that I do perform to be in more of that high magic area. But I also think that high magic is more about exploring yourself and getting in touch with divinity in a way that kind of bonds you to it um you know as a pantheist i believe that high magic actually just helps me to acknowledge something that i'm already aware of but that i need to sometimes plug back into whereas low magic of course it's for practical practical purposes more everyday purposes but it gives you the added advantage added advantage of being able to um, study your progress, have a look at what works, what doesn't, test the waters. Um, so it is kind of more scientifically viable in a great many ways than high magic, than ceremonial magic. Um, low magic is more like the bread and butter that will actually show you what progress is being made and what actually works for you. So I think high and low magic, although they're, they're unfortunate terms, um, I'm just using them here to express how I feel that both kinds are actually valid. And I would like to kind of tap in more to my ability to appreciate and to perform low magic as well. And I think black and white magic is something, I mean, I'll probably do a video about the concept of the left hand path uh, and why I actually use that term, because I, I wrote a blog post about it recently. I think that black magic and white magic are obviously unfortunately divisive terms and I don't think that they're necessarily helpful. I do think that the terms right hand path and left hand path make a lot more sense. Um, the right hand path will basically be about indoctrination into a certain moral code using a certain moral standpoint and certain rules which will steer you in the right or light right handed direction. Um, the left hand path is more used to describe unorthodox methods, um, potentially socially unacceptable methods or methods that have not yet been explored or considered to be um, OK by the standards of the magical community or not considered necessarily to work, but are more kind of like the Wild West of witchcraft, if you like. And if you look at the original meaning of left hand in Tantra, it doesn't have anything to do with this very Christian slash European linguistic meaning of left hand. Um, in in Latin, sinistra actually meant um, left-handed or left-hand way, um, but it actually got turned into um, something something sinister or, you know, something kind of like a little bit more dark in the European era of uh, Latin speaking. Weirdly, sinistra came to mean something dark or abhorrent. And then this chick who was like the theosophy queen, Madame Blavatsky, I don't know if anyone's heard of her, but she actually studied Tantra and she ended up using the tantric term left-hand path in her teachings in theosophy to mean black magic or unpleasant magic or whatever. And it was very, very easy for her followers to latch onto this because of course, if you look at the progression of the Latin language, uh, left came to mean sinister. Sinistra became sinister, which means evil, negative, unpleasant, whatever. And because of this certain passage in the Bible, uh, which is in Matthew, actually, which basically talks about how he separates the sheep and the goats and the sheep he puts on his right, but the goats he places onto the left. Um, this is where the idea that the left hand or left handed or that kind of um, that kind of left side is bad or for um, evil or unpleasantness and right hand pertains to you know the sheep the followers the flock the pure um, and left hand pertains more to like the dirty the heathen the unbelievers that's where it actually came from in terms of Christian or European thought but actually in Tantra left-handed simply meant unorthodox methods and actually in Tantra both right hand and left hand paths are considered to be perfectly legitimate ways of, of tapping into Godhead so there's actually been a miscommunication there linguistically. 
So actually, if you look at it, left-hand path is a really good way of describing my kind of pathway, which is about the unorthodox, it is about breaking those boundaries, it's about using taboos as, in fact, powerful psychological ways to get in touch with divinity. It's about not leaving anything out. It's about the idea that everything is valid in the circle. Everything is permitted. So that's why I use the term left-hand path to explain my own magical practice. And it doesn't really have anything to do with left-hand as in sinister. It's actually from a completely different tradition and it means something totally valid. I think I may have explained that really badly, but I wasn't actually planning on going into the left-hand path thing at all. But while I was talking, I was thinking, well, if I'm talking about my magical practice, I might as well mention that I consider it to be left-handed. So yeah, the, the three models of magic and how I feel about all of them and how I feel I'm kind of a little bit of a dose of them all. And the way I came back to witchcraft after that time of not feeling able to own my personal power and feeling very weak and very vulnerable and scared and fucked up about the world, going into nihilism, going into things like self-neglect and self-harm, coming out of that and recognising, like re-recognising the beauty in everything was a big part of me coming to terms once again with the fact that I am a witch and it's evident and it's something that can't really be denied and, you know, it's something that my mum would gladly say about me <laughs> and my boyfriend too, um, is that I am organically a witch and I've always felt like a witch. There's always been something about that term that has been extremely potent for me and not just in a way that's glamorous or exciting, but in a way that made me feel something on a very deep level, made me feel something that I could really tap into, something that I was already plugged into um but just needed to kind of own the word for myself and I think when I came through all of that negative crap and I became to actually I became able to get in touch with my core being again and appreciate and trust my intuition again and think of myself as not a waste of skin but in fact as a, a moving breathing conscious part of the overall divinity that you know resides inside everything that's when I could once again come into my um my identifying as a witch I guess you could say and I think I might talk about that more in another video but yeah I think that being a witch for my part at least does require self-love and self-respect you cannot be neglecting yourself and thinking of yourself as less than dirt letting yourself be manipulated um, you need to have some strong sense that you are worthy and that you are powerful and that your power means something and resides inside you and if you lock it away and you don't identify with it, then it's very difficult to identify with the term witch. I think that as I've sorted my life out and sorted my head out and gotten to grips with what I feel I deserve from this life and what I want to feel, what the joy that I want to take from it, the hedonism that I want to experience, um, those ecstatic moments where I feel one with everything and completely connected and plugged into the universe, that's where the power to own the word witch comes from. And when I didn't have those feelings and when I was in the pit of nihilistic despair, it's obvious now why that meant that I distanced myself from witchcraft and everything to do with it. Because I didn't have that strong core being and it takes a strong core being to actually do it. This is probably the most personal video that I've done on the channel so far, so I'm a little bit nervous about putting it up, but I will do so and I hope it wasn't too rambly. I'm going to end with a little bit of writing from The Celtic Spirit by Caitlin Matthews, Meditations for the Turning Year, because I just felt it was relevant, so I will read it to you now. The Tune of the Cosmic Dust Those who, like Einstein, come daily into contact with the physical laws that ordered the universe cannot help but catch the strains of that great dance in which we are all whirling. Whether it be in the intricacy of cellular formation, or in the flow of currents, or in the vast patterning of the stellar orbits that illuminate the heavens, scientists are privileged to see into the structure of that dance. The inapprehensible motion of life escapes our daily awareness, as does the tune of the cosmic dust that orders us all in one great dance of life. We do not hear it playing until we come to a point where our ordinary and subtle senses are aligned together. Then we come into harmony and awareness of both worlds at once, the apparent and the unseen worlds in conscious communion within us. These privileged moments cannot be sought. They come unbidden, surprising us into mystical vision. It may be that when we interrupt a walk on a high place at evening to admire the view, we apprehend the revolution of the earth as a physical motion beneath our feet. It may be that, be that we become aware of a rhythm that weaves about the steady beating of our own heart as if it were a partner in the dance. 
The resonances to which we respond and the relationship between ourselves and the music of life give us the only clues available about the nature of the invisible partner, clues reassuring enough that we can trust the source of our music, attuned to the cosmic tune and rhythm of life, stand and dance. Blessed be.